Welcome, welcome to the launch of the first in a series of Anthropology Communicates. And thank you so much to the RAI and especially Hanin Habib, um, as well as my colleague in SOAS, Richard Axelby, uh, for organizing this. So this is, this is the first in a series um, and it's hosted by the RAI's committee on the anthropology of policy and practice. And this, this committee is for anthropologists or for people who are really passionate in anthropology, uh, who are either in universities or are working um, in organizations in society. And this um, committee has members who come from both universities, but, but other organizations. And we have kind of three main purposes as a committee. We're interested in providing uh, a forum for the discussion of research. We're interested in improving the links between anthropologists and policymakers and practitioners. And we're also interested in promoting anthropology, promoting uh, the understanding of it as a discipline, but also promoting it to have more influence. Um, and that's why we conceived uh, as a committee it, uh, of this uh, seminar series, which is all about how to communicate anthropology to different audiences. Um, so we, we host events, uh, we do research and we engage with um, government, parliament, civil society. And in this series, um, I'm delighted to introduce the COVID and care research group, which do all of these things. Um, and um, the lead researcher, uh, Laura Bear, of course, doesn't really need any introduction at all. But I do just want to say how happy I am um, that she and her team are kicking off our series because it is so timely. Um, and I do also just want to remark on the extraordinary fact that she not only does research on the anthropology of the economy, infrastructures and time, and our current uh, research, as we're about to find out, focuses on the unequal effects of the COVID pandemic on vulnerable UK communities, but she also writes books, the latest being Navigating Austerity, Currents of Debt Along a South Asian River. She also finds time somehow to head the LSE Anthropology Department, and she sits on one of the SAGE subgroups, Scientific Pandemic Influenza Group on Behaviours, um, and much else besides. Uh, so Laura, thank you so much for coming today with Kiran Kur Bhopal, Jordan Vieira, Nikita Simpson and Catherine Whittle. And I believe there are also others from the group uh, who, are, who are attending today. So we might hear from them in the discussion. So if I could hand over uh, to the team uh, and we'll hear from them first for about 50 minutes or so, uh, both um, about their research, but also how they've been in discussion with policymakers. And then we'll have plenty of time for, for discussion and we've got instructions in the chat box about how to ask questions or put your hand up. And it might get a bit chaotic because we have already got 83 participants. Um, but actually I think chaos is a bit more entertaining than a really sort of well-managed event. So let's just uh, go for it. So over to you, Laura, for um, so that we can hear about your research. Thank you very much, Emma, and thank you very much to the RAI to, you know, for giving us the chance to reflect on something that we've just been in the midst of and just kind of living. This is a rare chance to step back and, uh, yeah, to think about this experience and what it might mean for other anthropologists and for all sorts of ranges of policymaking, not just that on COVID. I thought I'd just begin by explaining a little bit about who we are and our sort of core guiding principles, how we came together and then some of our methods. Um, and then I'll hand over to different members of the team to really reflect on uh, how the different segments of the report speak to different aspects of policymaking. <laughs> 
So we are actually a genuine collective of anthropologists, of 20 anthropologists, mainly based at the LSE, but also at Cambridge and other institutions. And we're fully cross-generational as well. Uh, we include um, um, Elena Wirt, who has just recently graduated with a BA um, in anthropology from our department. Uh, we have nine PhD students. We have four postdocs and six permanent members of staff. Um, and being a collective, we're also very, very, we hold collaborative, col being collaborative is at the core of our principles. We're collaborative with each other. We've discussed ways, and innovative ways of doing that. We're collaborative with community organizations and groups, with policymakers and, and informants as well. Um, and we're in fact in our next stage uh, using some experimental citizen science methods as well to bring people fully on board. And what we do at the core of our work is applying a social calculus to policy. Um, this is something that I wrote about many years ago in my book, Navigating Austerity, but I didn't think I was actually going, going to live it and it was going to have life breathed into it by, by so many people. But a social calculus means that we always look at how policy contributes to or reduces inequality as a way of measuring its value. So our engagement with policy is not just as helpers for policy, but as sort of radical critics of policy as well. Um, we see our role to, is to, you know, as much critique the government's COVID policies as to contribute to them. We want to question the terms of engagement, and we also want to reverse some of the methodologies and techniques that are usually part of policy um, processes. Um, now, obviously our focus at the moment is on COVID and care, um, but we plan in the future to hopefully contribute to other areas of policy as well. And we came together for a very interesting reason. I think like most anthropologists, we were experiencing a moment of existential crisis and uh, were part of the sense of you know, global uncertainty as well. As the first lockdown happened in the UK, we were very unclear as to what anthropology could be in a time when social interactions were restricted and whether anthropology could really continue to be a, be a discipline that used um, its, its very powerful methods of participant observation to really contribute to significant issues. And it was in that context that I um, took the personal decision to join SPY B, one of the committee subcommittees under, under SAGE. And it was in that context that we were brought a question, a really live and important and profoundly um, anthropological question as well by the Civil Contingencies Secretariat, which was what should the government do about the potential of excess death in the first uh, wave of the pandemic? How should they deal with the question of funerals, of pe giving people a good death in that context? And the policymakers had no way of answering that question at all. They couldn't use their usual techniques of focus groups. Um, and, and it was clear that they had run to the limit of their, their usual methods. Methods. So I took that question to the group of people in LSE Anthropology and we came together very quickly in the space of 10 days and produced a brief for um, the Cabinet Office on how to deal with these questions which then had immediate influence on policy in Public Health England, the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. Um, and uh, we realized in that moment that we really had something to say. And, and in that context, what we did was we made visible experiences of trauma in the wider population as to not being able to hold proper funerals, not being able to visit relatives in, in, in hospital, but you also could make visible, invisible values that really wouldn't usually come into policymaking values of faith. So I think we were buoyed up by that. And then we came together in the project on COVID and care. Now, just to say something briefly on our methods, what we do is we actually reverse the usual methods of policy making. Um, as I know from now being a little bit inside government, policy making usually occurs through a process of top down questioning and then a reaching out to for different sources of information. But what we've done in our COVID and care project is to begin with a kind of depth ethnography in places that many of us have been working for long periods of time. Um, and on that basis of that depth ethnography to raise questions about what, have ha what has happened to networks of informal and informal care during the pandemic, how people's ability to get by, to support each other, to maintain kinship links have been severed, 
um, and also the challenges, the burdens of uh, kinship and care work that have been intensified because of, uh, in particular, the cutting of formal services during, especially the first wave, but still in the second wave as well. And so we began with that depth ethnography, which then raised certain questions for us. And on the basis of those questions, we then reached out to uh, what we would consider local experts within these particular micro situations, people who sit across a wide range of social networks and social connections and can see across those. So they would include people in local authorities, but also people in these new mutual aid groups that have developed, who could really give us um, a kind of overview from the ground up of the challenges facing people. And through that process, we started to break down our assumptions about who had been disadvantaged during the period of the pandemic in the UK and how disadvantage was, was now currently being formed. So rather than starting with the category of BAME or the white working class, um, we, we went inside these situations and, and tried to find out how disadvantage was generated. And then we went to the norm, more normal methods of policy. Then we started to construct a survey, which was led by Nick Long, one of our team as well, um, that we sent out to 3,800 recipients in, in the UK. And our questions in that survey were generated from our initial depth ethnographies. And our analysis of that survey involved, again, both qual and quant analysis, fundamentally informed by the categories of understanding that we'd learned from our depth ethnography. So those were our methods, and uh, I think that these do challenge a lot of the usual forms for policy making. And uh, we produced from these methods a whole range of smaller briefs, which informed different aspects of policy making from, from March onwards, and I'll say a little bit more about those um, later on. Um, but we also generated, we spent a long time generating this longer report because we wanted to have a substantial intervention that wasn't only driven by the cycles of policy making, but we wanted uh, the time and the space to really explore issues in depth and reflect what, what we'd learned. And we see the smaller briefs that we generate as being step, stepping stones on the way to this larger decisive intervention. And going forward, we will also make similar smaller briefs, we will put those out. But we want this report to really stand, um, stand on its own as a way of displaying not just practical interventions that the government could take in order to create recovery from, you know, renewal and recovery um, during and after COVID, but also as a way of um, uh, sort of generating a, a space for anthropological viewpoints to really take centre stage. So uh, what I'd like to do now, um, having introduced a little bit about our project, is to hand over to Jessica Kieran Bogal, who's the first of our um, uh, the collaborators who's going to speak to you. Um, and in particular, each of these collaborators are going to reflect on the engagements with policy during the process of research itself and how that's reflected in the different segments of the report. So. Jessica Kieran, do you want to take over from, from me? Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, I'd really like to take the next few minutes or so to focus on the household section of our report, which is the first kind of key section of, of our report and what we identified as, as being invisible in COVID policy throughout the, the, um, the pandemic, but also at the core of UK society and the economy. This was really evident when we started to come out of the first lockdown and we saw in Boris Johnson's briefing that a lot of the what was being lifted wasn't really in relation to households and families and how how they were going to deal with coming out of this lockdown, how they were going to start to interact with their families in a way that they really had hoped to, given the, the restrictions that we'd been under. So we started to think about policy and politics and how important this was at this key moment in time. And this is because now policy and politics started to really make explicitly how people should live. Um, I identified this um, personally through speaking with Sikh multi-generational households, primarily in the West Midlands and in the Birmingham area. And I took some of the key restrictions and key policies that um, had been put in place and tried to work out how these were really affecting people and what these actually meant to people's lived experiences. Um, 
the first was to think about this rule of six and this was the uh, the original rule of six which was where um six members of any household could meet at any one time and some of the interlocutors that I spoke to felt that they had been really penalized by this particular um, this particular policy because it meant that if they lived in a household of more than six people, for example, one group of my respondents were, were a household of nine, they couldn't then meet with other members of their family as a group, as a collective, um, unless they chose to do that in a way that meant that only a few members of that of that group would meet up. When there was an announcement that two households of any size could meet around August time, this started to feel like groups like this were being listened to and that they were able to start to interact with their families in a way that was important to them and with other households that were really important to them. But then when we dropped back to this new rule of six that has quite recently been enforced has led to a lot of upset and trauma for these groups of people that have felt that they've been re-stigmatized, particularly as Sikhs fall into the BAME category. Another really important um, policy was when uh, places of worship were closed, particularly over the first lockdown and how this impacted interlocutors. So for my interlocutors, members of the Sikh community, the Gurdwara, which is the Sikh place of worship, isn't only a place of worship, it's actually an extension of the household. It literally means house of the Guru. So for a lot of these people, the closure of this particular site was more than the closure of a building. It was a, it was a lack of access to family and a household in a way that they'd never had before. And this was really important because it was quite detrimental to people's mental health, physical health and social well-being in a way that they never experienced and never anticipated before. Another impact was of, of um, the, these policies and the way that households were understood by the government meant that families had to really reconsider how they operated. So another really important example is that the way that Sikh multi-generational households is also different from how we would understand a multi-generational household. A lot of these families now don't live in the same building, of, like I say, the same house, which is what we would call a household. Often you have elderly parents or grandparents that live in a house next door to or in very close proximity to other members of the house. So, for example, um, a group of my interlocutors were a, a grandparent and her daughter and her son living under one roof and very close by was another family. So the the elderly lady plus her um, her son son-in-law, daughter, and their two children. And the way that they operated as a household unit was that the grandmother would take care of childcare responsibilities, take the children to school, feed them, and she would work herself as well and was put on furlough with the, with the lockdown. Um, and then this meant that they were no longer able to operate in this way where they would share resources such as food shopping, um, they would cook for each other, and they would operate as though they lived under one roof, even though they didn't. This became really quite detrimental to families understanding how they lived. So the impact of policy on family is, is really important in this way. And you can read a bit more about it in my specific spotlight in the report. So I'm gonna stop with that element there and move on to another really key part of the household, which was for us challenging the ONS categories. So in the survey that Laura mentioned um, before, we took, the, we took these categories within our survey and Use, we really drilled into the data to start to question these categories. And, and when we did this, we started to understand people's actual lived realities. And they were quite different from these categories. We started to understand that people had flexibility in their, in their lived relationships, and they didn't really subscribe to how we thought that they would operate. For example, couples who were in relationships but didn't live together or weren't married really weren't considered in the way that policies were put in place and how people could meet up, particularly if they, they also didn't live in a single person household and weren't able to bubble. It also meant that these categories were put on groups of people in ways that they didn't necessarily identify with. And I'm sure we'll speak about this a bit later, but for example, the BAME category started being applied to people who didn't identify as BAME, but now had to as a result of the way that policy and guidelines were being um, distributed. We also found that these categories were quite narrow. So for example, in this recent lockdown, we found that childcare bubbles are permitted, but the way that they're worded is really vague and unclear and doesn't really allow us to understand who can do what and what's really permitted. 
Another really important element for us was to consider gendered care and specifically the role of mothers. This was really important because policy had a huge impact on the informal networks of care. And this was all about how um, we saw in the, in the first lockdown that there ended up being a U-turn on childcare and the importance of informal networks of care and support. And we've seen this implemented in policy in this lockdown specifically where playgrounds and playgroups are allowed but the problem is that these are these have to be formal and organized. And this leads to some kind of debate about what support networks actually are and what is considered as a formal network of care and what's con considered as an informal network of care. So what, we have, what we've really learned from this is that we need a lot more emphasis on what is meant by these informal networks of care and how crucial they are to the way that people live. And this is really evident throughout the whole, throughout every single segment of the household, whether that be Sikh multi-generational households, whether it be single mothers, whether it be any kind of household in the way that we understand it. Um, thank you so much for listening to this really short presentation. And I look forward to taking any questions a bit later on. I think we're handing over to Jordan now. Hello, I'm very happy to be here today and thank you for this opportunity. Um, before I begin, just a quick caveat, I should say that my colleague Connor Watt, who unfortunately could not be here today, uh, collected the majority of the data that I'm going to discuss. So I'm perhaps a stand in for today's discussion. Uh, about the process of engaging with policy makers. Um, but so as I said, I do not um, unfortunately have a big role to play in data gathering or working with policy makers. However, I was involved in the writing up process and thinking through some of these larger themes that we've already um, heard discuss um, a little bit and linking together the vast majority, um, or excuse me, the vast array of uh, different data collected by uh, or 20 um, anthropologists working on this report. Um, so for the section that I worked on, on um, care provisions in communities um, primarily channeled um, and coordinated through local councils. Um, we received um, data um, from um, vast array, including um, early year providers, uh, the homeless, mental health services, um, domestic violence workers, and other groups. Uh, so in that way, I always thought it was working through this, it was quite incredible to have such a wealth of, um, of data uh, that a single anthropologist working alone just could not have done, especially in the time, um, the time frame and scale in which we were working. Um, so I'm going to focus on the provision of community care services uh, that the report discusses, drawing on primarily on our work um, in Hackney uh, with Hackney Council. Uh, my colleague Connor was much more embedded in the field, as it were, living in Hackney, um, which forms the focus of our case study in the report. Early on, he joined a mutual aid group at the onset of the lockdown, uh, an organization that offered services and help such as food provision for people who could not or did not wish to seek help from the state. And this included many migrants with precarious legal statuses and people in trouble with the law uh, for whatever reason. But they were all people who were in desperate need of care uh, in one way or another. Now, Hackney Council approached this mutual aid group as part of a larger process of wanting to develop provision of care, um, excuse me, de uh, devolve provision of care to mutual aid groups, uh, which is still the primary policy of Hackney Council. Uh, the Hackney Council have their own in-house aid force um, and team, but still want mutual aid groups to take additional uh, responsibility uh, due to austerity uh, funding cuts. Uh, while they have some resources to provide care themselves, uh, they are able to save money through siphoning off responsibility to mutual aid and other community groups. As part of this dialogue, my colleague spoke with people in the strategic policy team of uh, the Hackney Council, and he continues uh, to speak with them through his involvement in mutual aid groups. Uh, this policy team constantly speaks with people who work on the ground among different community groups in the borough. An easy connection um, to make with council authorities because of their outreach uh, in a grassroots kind of way. Uh, so my colleague Connor is in constant communication uh, with uh, members of the strategic policy team in Hackney Council. Um, and there's a very close connection in Hackney between people feeding 
in data um, through these community groups and those in the council making policy decisions. Uh, so in that respect, Hackney Council, perhaps exceptionally, um, is situated well to have an ear to the ground, so to speak, um, and is perhaps different, um, different to the situation of policymakers at the national level. Now, this highlights the dialogic nature, nature excuse me, of not only our research process, but the processes that our research is examining. Uh, there is continual discussion, not just between researchers and community groups and local policymakers, but continuous discussion between policymakers and community groups. Um, and this is guided through such mechanisms um, led by Hackney Council, uh, such as the Community Impact Report and a group called Neighborhoods with a capital N. Um, a discussion group for addressing needs of various community organizations um, within Hackney. So many conversations are had through these mechanisms about what groups require in order to meet effectively a community needs. Um, of course, within the constraints of funding against the backdrop of a decade of austerity. Now, something that we kind of struggled with in writing um, this section were these tensions um, that we had to navigate between our inclinations as anthropologists and writing for policy makers. So there are anthropological questions um, versus policy questions and a tension between critique on the one hand and praise, um, perhaps what we might construe as praise on the other. So one of these is, you know, you know, we didn't really want to draw attention to what some might champion as the David Cameron's big society concept. Um, you know, in effectively championing kind of a liberal, neoliberal, excuse me, um, mindset of community groups, groups essentially getting on um, and, you know, rising to the challenge of addressing community needs. Um, so we had to discuss, sure, there were instances, many instances of community groups rising, rising to this challenge. Um, however, not enough is being done because of the decade of austerity um, and the continuation of neoliberal governance that makes addressing the full spectrum of community, of community need um, quite challenging. So again, our ethnography that we present challenges, um, hopefully enough, um, that narrative um, and looks at the uh, funding issues created by austerity um, and synthesizes different reports by other groups, um, such as the Institute for Fiscal Studies um, and the National Organization of Voluntary um, Organizations. Excuse me. Um, so again, so we had to develop a strategy to write in a particular way for a particular um, objective. And regarding policy, some commentators, both anthropologists and a few non-academics, have already questioned what they have read as a somewhat facile assessment of local authority in Hackney, essentially championing the local council without a uh, more critical assessment. Um, and this is something that Connor and I discussed repeatedly um, and deliberated over and having on Connor's part spoken to many, many people in different groups, uh, he voiced his concern um, that we didn't want to give local authority a free pass from criticism. Um, however, on balance, uh, it's a specific writing strategy uh, for this report. Um, and we thought it best to outline what practices, perhaps uh, might, what might be considered best practices and Hackney might be both effective on the whole and more immediately transferable to other areas um, in the country due to the immediacy of the COVID situation uh, and now second wave lockdown that we just entered. Uh, so of course, this highlights a very interesting temporal dimension um, to the question of anthropology, ethnography, and policy of needing to write something for a more immediate impact uh, rather than what could very well be a months long reflection and theoretical discussion um, and framing. Uh, so in that regard, again, it was challenging to get past the kind of paralysis by analysis, um, striking the balance between critical assessment um, and you know, anthropologists tend to always find something to critique and then others critique the critique and others still critique the critique of the critique and so on. Um, but for us, it was about finding something for again, the immediacy of the situation um, to create something that can hopefully be transferable with future critique uh, coming later um, amidst the ongoing process of the research. So that being said, just a few areas um, to highlight where that didn't quite make it into the case study um, when we've discussed happening. Um, but 
are avenues uh, to explore a, a further critique are the ways in which the groups that we're advocating su uh, support for are small groups quickly put together in several cases, perhaps uh, transient. Um, however, in their funding scheme, Hackney Council focuses more on established groups and had somewhat of a reluctance to engage with the ad hoc groups, um, so to speak, that sprung up uh, due to the immediacy um, of, of need uh, that's the initial lockdown. Even this overall engagement uh, lacks the funding to engage as effectively as it can uh, with the structure that is already there in place and which we argue in the report can be replicated in other boroughs um, throughout the UK. Now, while council, uh, Hackney Council feels the brunt of blame amongst local community members, um, their hands are a bit tied. Uh, while exacerbating social tensions, a case can be made um, that the council, um, because of having to deal with certain with uh, long social history of gentrification and trying to, uh, along with austerity, of trying to attract a middle class um, community um, to engage uh, for financial investment because it's not coming from the state, um, that this creates various tensions um, and discriminatory um, policing practices, um, lockdown, um, of lockdown regulations. So, just um, to sum up then, in our proposals, um, we highlight that we were already at breaking point um, in terms of what services local councils could provide. And all these systems that council is fine tuning are, are thoughtful, yet lacking in funding for a mo more robust implementation. Uh, the basic structure is already there and if funded, there's the potential to do well and provide sufficient care or is more sufficient care. Um, our report and the Hackney case study looks at a response to a situation three, four, five months after the first lockdown began and examines the reorganization of groups that redirected, redirected efforts as needed. While the initial picture that we painted might appear a bit rosy, uh, that's because of the timeline it captures, an immediate response. And now as we continue to engage amidst the second lockdown, uh, Brexit and beyond, we'll see more of the stress points and places to be critical. Were more critical. And while we strategically chose to initially focus on elements that we might refer to as best practices, we will now focus going forward more on the tensions and gaps in care provision. Uh, one area, for instance, um, is that the good spirit that had been there during the first few months of lockdown is now uh, fading. Uh, this has been somewhat due to the onset of the Black Lives Matter movement over the summer combined with uh, the differential policing of lockdown measures that I mentioned. But to finish on a positive note, the report is making its way through the very channels of community groups and council policymakers that it documents. Uh, I've been told that a leading, if not the leading civil servant for Hackney Council within the strategic policy team uh, said that she has received the report from multiple community sources and looks forward to reading it. Again, so thank you very much, and I'll now turn over to the next speaker. Great, thank you, Jordan, and hello, everyone. So the third section of the report, uh, which we've titled Supporting Livelihoods, focuses on the economy, and it acknowledges the importance of the economic support that was made available by the UK government in response to the lockdown period, whilst also problematizing the model of the economy that the Treasury appeared to be working with and designing its response package. In a previous draft of the report, we were playing with the idea of unreal economics, and we see our role as offering some anthropological reality to an economistic and policy-making world that is accustomed to working with highly reductive models that obscure the real quotidian relations that anthropology is so good at describing. We've emphasized in the report that we're not working with an abstract model of the economy or just working with quant data, trying to observe economic changes from a distance, uh, but rather connecting with real people's livelihoods and the relations of care that economic activity is inevitably entangled with. As with other sections, our critique of the government's economic interventions drew on both survey data and ethnographic interviews, some of which became case studies. We collaborated with consultants specialising in macroeconomics and labour rights, as well as drawing on our own pre-existing networks with research interlocutors. And the result of this 
this mixed methods and collaborative approach taken alongside our disciplinary commitment to community and household level lived experience of various forms of paid and unpaid labour has meant that we've been able to speak critically, clearly and meaningfully into an area where anthropologists aren't routinely recognised as having expertise. Uh, we hope that this report will make a contribution to changing that. So to run you through our main findings, um, the breadth of data that we gathered meant that we could start to break down assumptions about workers as a category, assumptions about the wage, business as a category, and so on. One case study was authored for us by Olivia Vickel, who founded the Work Rights Centre, an employment justice charity operating in London and Manchester. Their clients are largely from Eastern European and BAME British ethnicities in informal employment or recently unemployed, and their client numbers raised by about 80% during the first lockdown period. Insights from the Work Rights Centre highlight the experiences of those in informal or insecure employment, many of whom are relatedly in insecure accommodation, and so they cannot evidence their living costs for which they are then penalised by the universal credit system. Low income groups have become increasingly reliant on food banks, migrants face particular struggles at the intersections of a lesser entitlement to welfare, fear of mistreatment by the state and stigma. Interviews with owners of small to medium enterprises or SMEs highlighted the frustration that many small business owners were feeling, that government policy and advice overlooks their circumstances. Many didn't qualify for furlough, for example, um, and didn't consider loans to be useful since the repayments would strain their forecasted diminished income streams. One area we highlight is that the across the board measure of business tax relief has been designed for big business rather than primarily small businesses. The effect being that large supermarkets and delivery companies who have in fact profited from the pandemic were given tax relief needlessly, rather than that support being targeted to smaller businesses with real needs. And of course, cutting business rates shrunk the budgets of local authorities who were then left with even less resource to support the web of care provision at the community level that Jordan was talking to us about. At the same time, business owners have complained that their biggest cost for which they receive minimal help was rent. Support packages have kept some businesses viable, but often um, doing little more than covering their rent and those ineligible for support have gone under or may soon go under due to rent arrears. These experiences feed into our broader argument that the role of rentier capitalism has been ignored by the government pandemic response, which has focused on labour and consumption, whilst landlords have remained insulated, despite the fact that asset owners are those who are best equipped to weather economic difficulties. So insights from SMEs around the UK was one factor pointing us to a consideration of regional inequality since some regions, including Northern Ireland and the northeast of England, have higher proportions of SMEs than the rest of the country, and so face greater economic vulnerability. Steeper regional inequalities in unemployment then could be an outcome of the pandemic if support packages are not tailored to business size and ownership structure, and we call for more research into regional inequalities. There's more to be found in the supporting livelihood section of the report, um, for example, about citizens' advice concerns over household debt. But what we really wanted to explore with you today was the way that we've approached this research, aiming to generate dialogue with economists. Methodologically, our sustained engagement with interlocutors over a six month period means that we've been able to track opinions regarding government support measures and their impacts over time rather than assessing public response based on media coverage immediately after policy announcements, for example. So moving beyond the dishy rishi assessments, if you will. By evaluating policy, we're in their territory and we can engage with their language, but by doing so with ethnographic data, we're able to ground and nuance economic ideas and assumptions in social reality. So firstly, we're able to interrogate the ideal typical worker that the UK pandemic response to date serves well. By learning from diverse experiences of the deficit of formal care, the additional strains placed on informal care relationships by the pandemic in general, but especially life and lockdown, and the various challenges faced by key workers and migrant workers, we came to conclude that the policies chosen by the UK Treasury best served white, able-bodied British nationals, and especially men, in full-time secure employment with negligible caring needs. This ideal worker could easily work from home or from the office according to whatever the latest government instruction was. And needless to say, there are very significant proportions of the UK population or workforce that do not share all or any of these qualities. 
the role of the wage in the economy has also been oversimplified, um, both because for many workers, their wage is insufficient to cover their living costs, hence our statistics for in work poverty, and because the Treasury's focus on labour and consumption eclipses the role of rentier extraction. Through our research, we're seeing the pandemic exacerbate inequalities between asset owners and everyone else in real time. Following from this, we also break down the category of business, which has been homogenized. As I said, business has benefited needlessly from support big businesses um, when many small businesses continue to struggle or have gone under. Moreover, we highlight that small businesses are more than just a place of work, somewhere for people to earn money or grow their wealth. They are so often a hub of social relationships and a, mor a moral project for a family or community, not just labor then, but livelihoods. Small business owners wrestle with various dimensions of risk in this time, both epidemiological and financial, alongside their deeply felt obligations to relatives and to clients in their communities. We contrast this with large private equity firms who purchase businesses through debt, actively creating risk and minimizing the tax they pay both through their business model and their use of tax havens. This contrast illustrates the senselessness of a homogenized category of business. And in the report, we argue that these different business structures with radically different relationships to the state should not be receiving the same forms of support from the state. So overall, we draw on a breadth of ethnographic data to illustrate the ways in which the treasury model for the economy is outdated, not reflecting the contemporary UK economy. We call for a recognition of diversity and inequality in the UK's workforce and its businesses to generate more appropriate policy responses that attend to the lived experiences of both work and care relations. So now I'll hand over to Nikita, who's going to tell us about building cooperation and our case study in Leicester. Great, thanks Catherine and thanks everyone. We're so thrilled to have this platform. Um, so uh, I'm gonna reflect on the last section of the report, which is about building cooperation. Um, so one of the priorities in this report and associated activities around it has been to start a critical conversation about how the governmental response to COVID and how particular policies actually propagate blame narratives and produce new relations of stigma. So we found that the absence of comprehensive population level data on epidemiological transmission that is independent of testing foci mean decision makers and communities rely on assumptions and sometimes even stereotypes to calculate and explain risk from COVID. So this is problematic because they can lead to stigmatizing policy decisions that don't square with the realities of social life making it impossible for communities to be adherent. It risks building policy for a white middle class mainstream and then making exemptions or exceptions to engage hard to reach or vulnerable communities, such as people identified as BAME of particular religious or cultural groups. And we think that anthropological methods are uniquely placed to pick up on the inadvertent forms of stigma that issue from policies because they highlight the range of ways that policies are perceived by different communities and different parts of communities, and because they moor these, uh, these policies in the existing so, uh, social, historical, and so, sorry, historical and contemporary social divides through which um, they might be refracted. So this section um, of the report is primarily, primarily based on our work in Leicester. Um, Leicester was one of our case studies alongside Hackney, um, where we took a, a slightly different approach to some of the spotlights that, for example, Kieran has talked about. Um, our case studies are more, I suppose, holistic uh, in their approach, where we engaged a range of actors across faith groups, across ethnic groups, across class groups, and we also conducted a regionally specific survey. We used the same methods that Laura spoke about um, in the beginning, engaging kind of nodal figures who were able to re represent or see across different communities, and we kind of um, uh, thought about how these perspectives um, intersect with each other. Uh, so why did we choose Leicester? Um, Leicester was the first city to become an area of national intervention on the 29th of June um, this year. And these restri restrictions, we must remember, have actually never been removed. It's an important case study because it illustrates the impact of localized social restrictions on the perception of a place 
in the national imagination, as well as the self-perception of local residents impacted by that lockdown. What's also interesting about the Leicester case study, and I think particularly interesting for this series, is that we actually worked in parallel with the local lockdown um, task force, the response group. Uh, we joined regular meetings run by Public Health England and local authority teams that involved NHS staff, local public health officers, and other key stakeholders. And we triangulated the data that we were collecting with other forms of research that was going on, including interviews done by the local authorities, focus groups, um, and other surveys. We were asked to identify the perceptions of government policies that were being rolled out in real time and certain problematic areas or areas of epidemiological uh, risk um, that were being identified by that group. So we looked at things like communications, test and trace, door-to-door -door testing, um, the identification of particular postcode hotspots, uh, multi-generational households as they were being problematized in policymaking. However, our core contribution was actually to contrast different perceptions about these issues in the present, to link this to an analysis of social solidarities and divides across communities, and then to moor all of this in a historical understanding of how the near history of Brexit and the uh, 2019 general election um, and the far history of migration narratives and post-coloniality actually were being co actually contextualized the way in which people were perceiving risk of epidemiological in the present. So what did we find? We found that the local lockdown in Leicester was perceived as stigmatizing for the whole city. Survey responses showed that the intervention was highly divisive and people felt like they were forgotten, they were seen as the lepers of Leicester or the pariahs of Leicester, they felt ashamed like they were a laughing stock because they were still in lockdown after the National Day of Lessening of restrictions on the 4th of July. We also found that the government identification of particular postcodes in Leicester as hotspots of transmission was stigmatizing for certain ethnic and faith groups who were known by everybody to live in them. And that interestingly, this uh, stigma was inscribed through double-edged sword policies like door-to-door uh, -door testing, which were designed to be more inclusive of those very populations. We also found that workplaces were, were a significantly divisive issue. The politicization of sweatshops um, as vectors of transmission in the media was a central concern for respondents. Across communities, there was a perception that such issues of exploitative labor have existed for decades since the closure of large textile companies. And numerous respondents pointed out to us that it was not only a legal enterprise, but also large factories like the Samworth Brothers Sandwich Factory and Walker's Crisps, who also had inadequate conditions of work. We also found that there was significant blame um, between ethnic groups where existing social divides were being reframed by perceptions of, of epidemiological risk, where people were building boundaries between them and, and other communities um, uh, based on uh, COVID that were existing. Uh, so, for example, we, we picked up on strong social divides between Hindu, Sikh and Muslim communities that were exacerbated by a rise of geopolitical tension um, caused by Hindu nationalism, uh, troubles in Kashmir and the prevent policy. Another example is that we saw a significant antipathy between ethnic minority communities who are based in Leicester City and white uh, uh, people who were living in the counties that were exacerbated by the Black Lives Matter protests and caused the Black Lives Matter protests to be uh, stigmatized as a, as a space of epidemiological transmission. So what does this mean? Um, reflecting on this, we, uh, I suppose, sum up our argument as the fact that at present, the general population and people in policymaking processes are in a situation of extreme and radical uncertainty. As a result, they're speculating about COVID-19 transmission and how to prevent it. Speculation, as we anthropologists have learned from our research in other places, involves the projection of an invisible order onto a radically uncertain future in order to anticipate it or control it, to quote Laura's 
our previous research. Our research has revealed that this spe speculation involves a perception of new kinds of risks, where certain places, people and behaviours are associated with transmission and other people and groups are associated with increased vulnerability to such risk. By dividing the world into people who are risk givers or spreaders of the virus and risk takers or those who are vulnerable to such spread, this perception of risk can work to polarize, exclude and to stigmatize. How do we combat these processes of stigmatization and blame? We argue that it, we can combat these processes by building a fuller picture of how the virus is spread and how it's impacting people's lives, how people are responding to guidelines and how people are perceiving risk. This can be achieved precisely through the kind of rich and nuanced anthropological data that we can gather. So reflecting on engagement with the Leicester lockdown, we feel that this is a strong model for the involvement of anthropologists at local level policy response, in local level policy responses. And overall, we intend this case study to be an example of the kind of rapid action research that could accompany the introduction of local restrictions in order to map communities, trace emerging frontiers of stigma and support local public health responses. So just a small example there, handing over to Laura um, to wrap us up. Great, thank you very much, Nikita. Um, I wanted to end by speaking to all the anthropologists in the audience who might be both wary and excited about engaging in policy. And I'm going to end with some reflection on my own policy interventions as I've worked on SPI B and also the Ethnicity Subcommittee on SAGE. And my role as a sort of mediator trickster kind of smuggling anthropology into, <laughs> into policy. Um, and I've sort of come up with, um, I guess, four key principles that maybe all anthropologists could use in this strange situation. Um, the first principle is really to find the right space of action. I was really lucky to enter into policymaking in the context of SPI B and SAGE. The whole point of this organization is that it's composed of independent academics who meet together in weekly meetings and engage in this incredibly robust series of conversations and challenges, both to the questions that are coming to them from government, from civil servants and politicians, and to the assumptions um, that underlie those questions. So the actual sort of structure of our meetings is that we're sent um, potential areas of inquiry, we then remake the questions um, and push back against their categories of understanding. We then have you know, very uh, complex and engaged debates with each other about how to respond to the questions. And we kind of remake then the documents together and those are then eventually sent on to SAGE. So in all of that bureaucratic activity is actually um, embedded structurally a process of challenge itself. So this was the right kind of space of action to enter into because it enabled me to really enter into the role of being an independent academic. But of course, this kind of space has a disadvantage as well. Um, whether our policy is then seen as useful in the political process varies hugely, as I've also learned, um, you know, in a, in a way that produces a, a great deal, deal of, of modesty as well. But having said that, um, especially once uh, the SAGE documents started to be released to the public, um, we've, we've actually, that kind of robust conversation has actually traveled into the public domain. So the documents that we write, you know, within these corridors of power are then released into the public domain. Um, and they have started to become the news because there's obviously a huge divergence between them and uh, what the government has actually done. So I think I've been really lucky to find the right space of independent action here within the bureaucracy. And I would really encourage you to seek similar spaces. Um, the second kind of principle is to constantly challenge. Um, as I've already mentioned, the categories of understanding as we've seen in all of these great presentations here in our, in our report. And I just wanted to take one example of this in, in my work in SPI-B and also on the ethnicity subgroup. It won't have escaped your attention, um, as Nikita has already begun to talk about, that 
at a certain phase of the pandemic in the UK, there was a process of blame that started to emerge in the media, particularly around the multi-generational household. Um, and by um, implication, the BAME multi-generational household. As in June, July, local lockdowns were instituted, and in particular, the one on the eve of Eid, um, the media and the politicians um, started to begin this sort of narrative of the, the multi-generational household as being a sort of dangerous site of transmission associated around the eve of Eid with Muslim households. And this is, as we know from our Leicester work, generated a lot of stigma and blame within communities as well. Now, around the same time, SPIB got a commission from the Ministry of Housings, Communities and Local Government to look at processes of household transmission. Um, and the way that the question initially came to us really, uh, in, in many ways, shocked us and, and, and worried us because what the question was asking us was, how is household transmission causing outbreaks in workplaces? So the, the, the vector of transmission was seen as going from households to workplaces. And in particular, how were BAME and multi-generational households vectors for transmission? So we saw in this very question a kind of, you know, probably unintentional um, process of stigmatization. So we immediately pushed back against that question. And then the paper that we um, actually eventually wrote together, which included modelers, environmental experts, and you know, people like me, um, the whole document is on the one hand, an attempt to build policy that could help a wide range of households, but also a document that really pushes back against those sorts of assumptions, those sorts of stigma narratives. So it places at its heart um, the analysis of socioeconomic disadvantage and how that generates situations for transmission of COVID within households. Um, and and it, go, it looks through a whole range of structures of households in which transmission might be an issue. And it also doesn't only associate multi-generational households with BAME groups. It also made visible um, a new category for understanding households at risk that didn't use these ethnicized categories, which was the idea of a highly networked household or a household that had many social connections. So destigmatizing the categories themselves. And it also made visible the gendered labor within the household and how that then created risks for certain groups, usually women who were carrying out cleaning work and domestic work and care work that might expose them to the virus. So I think when you read bureaucratic documents, I mean, I knew this as an anthropologist of bureaucracy, but now I really, really know it from the inside out. Whenever you read these documents, there's a process of argumentation and challenge going on within them um, that has um, ha continues to work and continues to have effect. When we return to these questions again in the ethnicity subgroup recently, we again use these more general categories, these destigmatizing categories, and looked at the more broader question of how to keep people safe in their households. So that's a process of challenge. Another principle is, and this goes against everything Foucauldian, but I still think it's true, um, uh, it's that, that our role, you know, as anthropologists in the bureaucracy should be to name and make visible. And I think that we should take into bureaucracies the power of our own disciplinary analysis to name things that would otherwise not be seen in policy at all. And of course, the primary thing here that I'm talking about is these networks of kin and care. Now, very early on when I joined Spybe, partly inspired by Nick Long's work, who had looked at social bubbling in New Zealand and was one of the early anthropologists to write about that, I started to press the cause during the first lockdown of introducing social bubble policies, which would allow people to socialize rather than being totally fragmented from each other. That fragmentation obviously carries a very heavy cost in terms of mental health and in terms of dealing with care burdens. So I tried to begin a conversation about how you could lift social restrictions to reduce in ways that would not lead to epidemiological costs, but could allow um, some of those social burdens and mental issues to, to reduce. So around the 10th of May, um, I led on a paper that was looking at how you could apply the social bubble policy, but not just how you could apply it to the standard nuclear household or two person household, but how you might apply it to different community types. And, and obviously, um, Jesse Kieran has talked about its particular relevance for, for BAME groups. 
And I argued for a dialing up and down of different social bubbling intensive intensification of connections between different sizes of households. Now, unfortunately, Sage um, agreed that the policy was a good idea, but they said it was it was too early to introduce it because the R number was still still high, which I think was a lost opportunity because two weeks later, after the Dominic Cummings incident, the government decided to open everybody up, you know, to open all sorts of socialization up at once. And we would have been much better off actually taking this dialing up and dialing down policy of social interaction. And this has actually become a recurrent problem in government policy. We seem to be veering between either total restriction that we're in now or total freedom with total freedom is problematic for epidemiological reasons and total restriction is problematic for mental health and care burden reasons. So, um, and then this has risen again as a problem around Christmas, should we have the rule of six again? Um, I, I don't think it's breaching any confidence to say that I've been arguing very strongly for um, more rational social bubbling policies around the Christmas time. Now, what I'm, what I'm really telling you here is not a success story, a less a success story than with the multi-generational households. But what I'm saying is that as an anthropologist, I'm constantly able to name and make visible in these policy discussions things that would just not appear otherwise. And this is an ongoing battle. Let's see, let's see what happens at Christmas. Um, the final principle that I'd like to give you is um, the principle of finding the right allies. And this is something that's really come through for me in terms of the current health champions policy, which I'll say a little bit more about in a moment. Um, I found that it's really possible for anthropologists to talk to public health um, not just public health academics because of their interest in health disparity, but also to people in Public Health England, Public Health England civil servants. They have been steeped in the questions of health disparity for a very long time. They were probably brought up in, you know, being training in community health issues, and they have a deep frustration in particular at the lack of connection between local public health officers, central government and communities. And these connections in particular that have been eroded progressively since the 1990s, but in an accelerated way since the decade of austerity hit in uh, from you know, 2010 onwards. So they share some of the frustrations that um, uh, uh, Jordan has already told us about that uh, people within local communities share and anthropologists share about the ways in which public health mechanisms and community institutions have been eroded in particularly in the past decade. And I found these people to be really fantastic allies, particularly around Public Health England. Um, and as a result of those sorts of connections, those sort of um, affinities, um, uh, it's very interesting to note that after our Leicester work, which came from some of those affinities, Public Health England has now set up an ethnographic team, a rapid action team within Public Health England to go and try and build connections between local authorities, Public Health England and communities. So that has, that's had a real tangible effect, that affinity. But more recently in the health champions policy that was um, announced, you know, 24 million Ministry of Houses, Communities and Local Government that was announced, I think about 10 days ago, um, there's, I found sort of natural allies around that, Spivey and I uh, have written a paper around how to make that policy more than just about a superficial policy of communication to communities and how to use it as the thin end of a wedge to get back um, some of the, although not perfect, better new labour policies around supporting local authorities, supporting engagement with community groups and most crucially funding those. Um, so I've been arguing in particular for uh, tranches of funding going to build capacity of local community organisations and even more crucially perhaps the payment of a living wage at least to the people who might be engaged as health champions in, in local neighbourhoods. My final, my final point which kind of runs through everything um, is to say to you the fifth principle maybe or the principle underlying all of this is don't give up your independence um, and that means that has to take really tangible forms for me that has taken the tangible form of not just being a member of sage but also choosing to join independent sage so that if at any point i feel that i want to push back again Against government policies, I also have allies there and a kind of institution there that can help me do that. So thank you very much for listening, everybody. We very much look forward to hearing your questions and perspectives on what we've presented here.
Thank you so much to the whole team. That was completely fascinating. Very, very rich. And um, I'm really happy that my hunch that this would be a really good way to, to kick off our series has proved true. And what I mean by that is I felt it was really, really important that we listened to a group of people who who are having influence and are being listened to because of the richness of your research. So I'm just so happy to start with um, research that reminds us that the, the um, what anthropologists come up with is inevitably going to be complex. But what's fascinating is that you produce this really beautiful report, which is really accessible. I think there are, there are so many lessons um, for anthropologists communicating to any audience. Um, and, I, and I think for me, one of the really important ones is that you've made the case that really good anthropology produces trustworthy knowledge. And, and the reason that um, I say that is I think there are patterns, which maybe in this series we can explore, that um, mean that anthropologists continually return to certain neglected processes, if you like. So my experience of policymakers is as they always reach for the abstracts, uh, like, you know, we've got to change culture, we've got to do something at the institutional level, or they, they rush to the individuals and try and bring about behavioral change at an individual level. And what I'm hearing you say again and again is, you've got to look at the relationships. This is what anthropology is about, isn't it? So um, it's, the, it's the lived experience, not just of being in a culture or being individuals, but the lived experience in relationships with other people that create networks and connections of all, all kinds um, and, and of very diverse kinds. So one of the things I kept hearing you all talk, talk about was that we've got to persuade um, people who are under terrible pressure to simplify that um, homogenizing people always leads to trouble and that the differences in the diversity between people have to be properly researched. Another element which I suspect we'll keep coming back to in this series is um, the way in which you kept pushing at their boundaries that of, of definition. So family is defined too narrowly, work is defined too narrowly. So I heard you say again and again that there are various ways in which um, definitions need to be broadened and pushed. Um, and I think also anthropologists are very often questioning the quick moral judgments that are made, maybe sometimes unintentionally and unnoticed and taken for granted. Uh, so, so coming back to processes of stigmatization, for example, seemed to me a really valuable contribution we can make. So I heard um, some really interesting research, beautifully produced in, in this report, um, and some really interesting reflections already um, about how you actually got policymakers uh, to listen to you. Um, so thank you so much already. That's been a fantastic start to our series. I'm going to turn now to my supervisor, who I'm absolutely delighted to see. Um, Professor Anthony Good um, has the first question. So if you unmute yourself, Tony. Um, um, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Please okay. go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to follow on from what you've just said, but I'll stick to my original question, which is a fairly obvious one, given that I'm sitting in Edinburgh. Um, Catherine Whittle, I think it was, talked about um, in regional inequalities. And in a funny way, that actually the regional inequalities in the economic sphere are less than those in other spheres, because so much of what's gone on economically has been dictated by the treasury because the, the devolved administrations have very limited capacity to mount programs like furlough, for example. But there's been much greater divergence in other areas. For example, the rule of six, how has that been defined? And how, how has it been applied in different devolved administrations at different times? How has social care been defined? How has the social bubble been defined? What kind of advice have the devolved administrations given 
to their, to their citizens? And what difference, if any, has that made? I mean, this is a whole new research, a comparative research area I'm suggesting. It would be fascinating to know, for example, whether the Westminster government has been better or worse than the Scottish government in advising citizens and how citizens' responses to that advice has differed. Um, hello, hello, Tony. Good to, good to see you. Um, this, is, this is an issue that has been concerning me a lot because um, what's very, been very interesting about the Scottish government is that in a sense it's followed um, SAGE and SPIBE advice much more closely than the, the sort of London Parliament actually. And um, this is brought home particularly clearly by the fact that uh, Steve Riker, um, who I've collaborated a lot with on Spy B and on Indie Sage, is actually on the advisory group for the Scottish government. And he's been kind of taking in a purer form the, the Sage Spy B policies into the Scottish government's communication campaigns, into their social bubbling policy and the way that they've dealt with universities. Um, so, we, as you say, we do have a live social experiment underway that's not just a social experiment, it's a kind of public health experiment, unfortunately, as well. And it would be fascinating. Maybe, maybe Tony, you can get some of the students and PhD students at um, Edinburgh University to do some work that could feed into the next phase of our report as well. Because, I mean, my, what I, I'm obviously getting a kind of rosy vision of the, of the Scottish um, situation, in particular because I was drawn into they have an expert advisory group for trying to create more participation between the public and the government and they were really took forward a kind of social listening project that Steve and I proposed very early on in SPIBE um, through having um, a kind of telephone um, and writing engagement with the public about whether their rules were working or not. Um, so yeah so research to be done. Um, it's clear that the transmission rates are much better in Scotland, so there's definitely something to be learned there. I'm sitting in a Scottish social bubble at the moment, but he's being very <laughs> quiet, I'm happy to say. Okay, fantastic. Ne the next question um, takes us a little bit from the kind of research and what you found to turning it into policy. I'm going to take the questions well, I'm going to try and kind of make some kind of logic out, out of them. So I won't necessarily take them in the order that they were asked. So this one goes like this, and I'm going to leave it to you, Laura, if that's all right, to direct it to either people who have spoken or other members of your team we'd love to hear from as well. So this question goes like this. Um, and by the way, you've got lots of really positive comments. So do look in the, look in the chat because it's really heartwarming. Um, question is, um, could you tell us more about the process you took, which enabled you to move from anthropological insight to policy recommendation? I fear that may be a question for me as well, but maybe we can talk about maybe um, uh, Nikita, do you want to speak to that? And yeah, sure, absolutely. I think it's a question for Van from Vanessa. So I'm, I'm glad you asked that, Vanessa, because um, I've been collaborating with Vanessa on this in other spheres. But I think the key for this one was that we, and, and I wanted to say this in my presentation as well, is that the analysis was collaborative. So what we did was we took the, um, uh, we took everybody's separate uh, interview transcripts and we were able to find a way of ensuring everybody had seen somebody else's interview transcript so everybody was able to read across the data. And then we had a series of very facilitated workshops where we split into different groups and we discussed different issues that were arising across the data. And over the course of the series of workshops, we were able to move from um, particular insights to general insights and then um, workshop together, debate actually, what might be um, kind of productive uh, policy recommendations. And again, to return to what Laura was saying, um, we had to be, I suppose, fairly strategic about this because I think, for instance, for the, um, the economic section, we would have loved to kind of talk about uh, universal basic services or universal basic income, but uh, you know we're not experts in that area, and there's, there are people who are, have much more expertise than us. So we decided to go for much more specific recommendations that we thought could um, kind of 
uh, speak to very specific policy issues. I think we were also, um, I think what we look forward to in the future is taking some of these policy recommendations and working through them with people who really know what they're talking about on the ground. And I've already started having some conversations um, about this. For instance, um, I don't know if Richard Lee is here, but with uh, some very experienced, um, uh, you know, people who've been working in social community um, relations and, um, you know, housing and tenancy advocacy, we've been talking about what this idea of um, social recovery centres uh, that is a riff on the new labour policy might look like in real life. And we hope to take that into a workshop with people who can deconstruct it and put it back together to see what, what is feasible and what is idealistic. Um, yeah, I don't know. Laura, do you want to add anything? Yes, I suppose just to kind of make the point again that the thing that um, anthropology offers um, is not just um, sort of, you know, a kind of ear to the ground or processes of social listening. Um, what it offers is a series of kind of analytical tools and ways of describing social life that, that Emma spoke about. And I think that um, in order to um, construct policy, we need to really include an understanding of those social phenomena. Um, there have been different, I know that there are many ethnographers, I want to talk about allies within um, the civil service who actually trained as anthropologists as well, because I've met many of those um, too. And they're already engaged in that process of trying to give the analytical perspectives from anthropology um, some kind of purchase in policy as well. Um, and I think that um, very often when, when policymakers come up against sort of boundaries of their understanding, what they're doing is they're, they're perhaps lacking those terminologies and forms of understanding of, of the social, um, which of course you can't get from behavioral science, not even fully from social psychology, but there's a really rich set of um, analytical ideas within anthropology as well. And I think, you know, kinship, is, uh, is, is one of those, um, both because it makes visible um, these invisible connections, um, both their importance for keeping the economy going and keeping society going, but also in terms of their moral value. So I think that one of the reasons that government regulations um, have a low legitimacy at the moment is because they have not uh, really understood the moral value and uh, to those connections that people have been denied um, and, and so there's a kind of disengagement from rules that don't speak to those issues um, sensibly that you most care about which is your connections to your family and your community so yeah I think that's really helpful actually because that is so much more than take than listening and then re-presenting a list of views that the, the kind of analysis that you've described is such an important part of it. Um, so that's really, really helpful. So we've got a question. Um, the, the questions when written to everybody, I'm going to treat not as anonymous because they're, they're public, but if you want to write um, a question just privately to me, I'm Emma Crew, then, then I will anonymize. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not going to anonymize um, if they're, you just reminded me, Nikita, that it's, it's actually fine to, to use people's names. So Esri Karlbash, who's a member of the R R RAI committee, asks, did the research look at those labelled during the first lockdown as clinically extremely vulnerable, a group homogenised in a way not dissimilar to businesses? In particular, are there any lessons regarding the impact of government communication of policy? I do want to give some other people a chance to speak, but this is squarely within Nikita's field of, <laughs> of expertise. In fact, she wrote that section, I think, of the report. Sorry, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, and, and I think others, maybe Milena could speak to this. Is, is Milena here? Yeah. So basically one of the most interesting findings from the survey was that we um, we both had a specific section for people who were shielding where we looked at um, you know their interaction with the different government uh, policies and what they perceived as um, helpful and unhelpful and things like that, and their networks of care. But we also looked at, we also got this a lot of responses coming back with people saying that they were clinically vulnerable, um, as self-conceived as, as clinically vulnerable, um, but that they weren't 
uh, you know, they weren't told to shield by the government. So this was a kind of new category that emerged through the survey. So I wondered if Milena, Milena did our amazing survey analysis. So if she's here. Yeah, she is here. I can see her. Just, I've just found her. Don't, don't forget to unmute. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Now we can. Okay, great. Sorry, I um, wasn't expecting to speak, but um, everything that Nikita said is accurate. Um, it was a question that we asked on the survey. So we did ask um, survey respondents to respond if they were clinically vulnerable and to reflect on their experiences of um, their clinical vulnerability. Um, a lot of people mentioned specifically how they'd been informed to act by the government. So a lot of people mentioned receiving text messages actually from um, the NHS service and being quite shocked um, just that by the fact that they had been identified as clinically vulnerable, had been instructed to shield. And then we also realized that the category of clinical vulnerability was taken on by many people who hadn't been asked to shield by the government because they felt they had conditions which should have placed them in that category for a lot of people that was being asthmatic, um, being pregnant, um, being in other ways physically vulnerable that weren't necessarily related directly to um, COVID and the epidemiological qualities of um, the disease itself. So that was very interesting because people um, often took it upon themselves to restrict their own social interaction behavior based on their own feeling of vulnerability um, and then they took on government recommendations for shielding people, even though they might not have specifically met the criteria, um, uh, the medical criteria for vulnerability. So it's very interesting. Great. I'm delighted to say that Faye Gall uh, is currently an A-level student and it was thinking about studying anthropology and if anything, you've confirmed her hope to study it. <laughs> so she thanks you for very inspiring insight. Um, as does Jonathan Woolley, who says, thank you so much, utterly fascinating and really inspiring. Please could you comment on the applicability of ethnographic approaches such as yours to the study of government processes and institutions rather than citizens or street level officials? And while you just think about that, can I just say very shamelessly that I have just written a book about ethnographic approaches to the study of parliaments. And it was partly inspired by Stefan Fochwang, who I see is in the audience, because he made some comments when I presented a, a seminar, uh, which encouraged me to try and write for anthropologists for a change, because normally I'm writing for political scientists who are the people who are normally studying parliaments. So I, I've, I've um, just done that. So that's just a shameless plug for my book. Um, but Laura, who, who do you think should get into that one? Um, I, I am an anthropologist of bureaucracy. So as I said, I'm in, inside my field. Um, uh, Jonathan, yes. <laughs> Um, and I think that um, it would be it it would be great. I mean, that's in a sense this 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 has given me the opportunity to reflect on the processes of Sage itself and why it feels like a place that I can feel at home. But I'm only getting a slight insight into all of the mechanisms of government. And of course, Jonathan, the problem is that the rest of the processes of government are not transparent um, at all. So I think I'm going to challenge Jonathan to write the ethnography of <laughs> of the UK civil service in its COVID, COVID response. But um, does, does anybody else in the group um, want to comment on the anthropology of, of bureaucracy? I'm not sure who else is here. Who else is here, Nikita? Uh, we've got Deborah, Alice. Um, I'm also not sure beyond we that. Could actually, we could actually ask Deborah to speak about that from her other work in um, uh, on the sort of uh, local level government again. Yeah, I, I think you put your finger on something important, which is that it is usually much easier to get a little bit of access to people in, in local settings, um, whether they be civil servants or whatever, than it is to high level, high level kind of government types. Um, but I feel as though in this particular case, because of we, 
so having Laura as our sort of intro to to those higher levels, we, we at least have a way of speaking to them. And the other thing is that um, a lot of what came through was the importance of those local communities, not only civil servants and, and council people, but also kind of local NGOs and local um, community groupings, often which, which have a, a hugely rich grasp of what's going on, but very free, infrequently are actually listened to. So I think one of the things we managed to do was to get those groupings to sort of get their voices heard at, at this higher level. So in that respect, we were more acting as brokers to some degree than we were as, as kind of like doing a full on study of, of high level government procedures. I think what's really fascinated me, I mean, from, from the inside, is uh, the degree to which the civil service is um, concerned in the pandemic, certainly the parts that I have, you know, small access to, with, you know, really big ethical questions um, around, around the public good and, and how to act. Um, and I think, you know, any argument, any idea that we ever had that um, bureaucracy was a kind of iron cage in a barbarian way has really been, you know, put to bed. Um, uh, you know, it is, it is clear that um, it, it's not even that the anthropologist has to um, kind of let people know that they are engaged in morally significant acts. They, they already know that and they're already explicitly dealing with things in that way. And I suppose the challenge for the civil servants is how to transform that sense of the right way to act, given the information that's in front of them into actual kind of fine grained policy. Um, once again, I think probably anthropologists or local experts like those that Deborah has mentioned would be the best people to give them advice on that. Great. Ready for the next one? So we've got a question from Alexandra Odia. Um, again, saying an excellent presentation. Um, and she says, government usually relates to citizens as individuals from birth to death, to work, pensions, etc. And often policymakers find it difficult to develop policies that take into account households, networks, relationships, particularly, I think. So how can you make visible not just the quality of these relationships, but the scale at which they are present in society? Um, we could ask um, uh, Jessica Kieran to, to speak to that. Um, yeah, thanks so much for the question. I think this is a, it's a really important question and I completely agree with the fact that often government does usually relate citizens to these individual kind of events in life. Um, life cycle events we can see were one of the things that were almost aside from weddings were kind of the things that were protected almost um in a lot of the restrict in a lot of the policy that was put forward but part of the problem is that actually how do these these kind of events impact households networks and relationships and what are the relations between these themselves and i think that's actually been one of the best parts of our report. And actually I have to comment on the, the unique makeup of our team in terms of gender, ethnicity, and all of these different categories. And I actually think that's the, the very blunt answer to this question is the way that they can only be presented to society if they are communicated effectively by a group that is representative of that society. Um, and I think that that's something that's really unique and important in collaborative work and how we've been able to put put together a report that's actually enabled us to um, to be able to communicate this in a way that's understood. Um, I'm recalling a conversation with Nikita um, last week where she, she said that some of the feedback we'd got on um, the report was that actually an illustration that showed how, for example, multi-generational households operated really helped paint a picture that actually other people have these kinds of networks too, but maybe don't talk about them in the same language that perhaps my um, Sikh interlocutors did. And I think that if we can break these down, and, and I think Laura reflected on this as well at, at the end, 
that if we're able to maybe communicate in language that we can all relate to and break um, multi-generational households down, for example, into these different networks that maybe are a bit more relatable to other members of society, that we're able to then have this kind of conversation and really present this in a manner that is a bit more understandable for society. So if we take Dominic Cummings, for example, I don't think any of us disagree with his actions, but the point is we disagree with the way that they were done and that he was allowed to get away with this loophole that actually all of us felt felt in that way. And it felt like he was breaking the social contract that he helped to construct. And that's where this idea of trust and faith got lost. But if we we had that representation at that level, which, you know, it's quite, it's always quite concerning for me that things like ethnicity um, groups very rarely have people from different ethnicities and the people that came up with the category of BAME aren't people who come in the category of BAME. Um, like I personally wouldn't identify myself as BAME but have to for, for the purposes of, of what these policies are and how they're communicated. So thank you for the question because I think it's a really important one. That is so interesting. So so the, the team was important in being able to create this very complex picture um, and the diversity within the team sounds like that was significant, but I'm now curious to know more about the relationships within the team. And this actually goes back to when Laura said at the beginning, you are a collective. I was very intrigued um, because it sounds, and at, at the time I was just thinking, oh, that sounds really exciting, but, but maybe it actually had an impact on the quality of the work you did. Is, yeah, that, is that possible? So. Uh, what did it mean exactly to be a collective? Yeah, um, thanks for the, the follow up, Emma, because I think it was it was really important that I think LSE anthropology itself is diversifying in the type of research that we do. And the fact that my so my PhD, for example, is with the Sikh community in the West Midlands. And it's very rare that you find research with Sikhs anywhere in the world in an anthropology department, for example. So I'm, I'm very lucky to have supervisors that are also both members of the team, one of them being um, the wonderful Laura, that I'm able to be able to then communicate my work to this kind of platform. Otherwise, I'm not too sure that the community that I wrote about in the report and was able to do research with would have been included in this way. And it was also crucial in the very first stages, um, as Laura mentioned earlier, with the Good Death Report. So the fact that the makeup of our team was anthropologists that would maybe be classified as indigenous or native anthropologists who are who have done previous research with these people were also able then to make sure that we had research across different groups and regions. So for example, um, my research is in the West Midlands and also in the North of England because it's where I'm from. So at the beginning when we did this very fast paced research, we had expertise across these different geographical regions because there's also a lot more anthropology at home happening. For example, with Laura, myself and, and Deborah and other key members of the team, for example, Alice and Olivia, that we were able to then have research and networks as anthropologists with communities that we already had networks with. And as Laura described at the beginning with our methods, we didn't have a top down approach. We really started from the roots, which I think is the most wonderful part of anthropology is that you start on this grassroots level and communicate upwards. And it feels like through Laura, this that this group has actually got a seat at the table. Like I'm actually an economic um, economist, um, by background that was my undergraduate degree so for me it's really amazing to be able to see a discipline that i actually value more highly getting a seat at a table where they should have always had a seat so i think that that's what was so unique about our collective and that there's a lot of early career researchers in our team too like milena for example myself as a phd student nikita and catherine and so on that we were all able to then pull together our research which is fresh with also people who have experience and and Laura's amazing connect uh, connections and even Nick Long for example with his connections to really build out of the collective in a way that I'm not sure I've ever seen in anthropology before. Thank you Karen that's really that's really good to hear because um, for me I feel that we've been inventing reinventing actually the positive the possibilities for collaborative work as we've all been in engaging in this um, obviously there's a model that's the kind of grant model where people have specific roles you know there's a PI there's a X there's a, you know and there's a kind of hierarchical role but I think what was really important from the beginning was that there was not that kind of structure 
structuring you know who got to provide ideas or who got to have the dominant role in shaping where the project went um, and um, and there was a constant process of dialogue that was kind of really built through the structure of having kind of meetups like this on Zoom really, really regularly and, and listening to each other and reporting back on what we were finding out as we were finding it. Um, and then, you know, to deal with the question of um, sort of authorship and ownership of data very often in these sort of, in the more hierarchical version of this, the person who was the PI would own the data. But we said from very early on that the people doing the research in a sense owned the data and everybody else had to ask permission or collaborate with them in order to use it in any publications. Um, and, our, and our work has been literally co-authored as well. So, um, you know, little team subgroups have co-authored parts and then other, other layers have been created on, on top of that. Um, uh, which is a very different model and we've made sure that anything that we publish, you know, including this one has everybody's name on it, um, uh, uh, which I think is really, really important. And as we go forward and each sort of subgroups um, peel off and do their own individual writing or collective writing, we've, we've basically said, you know, the more the better. We haven't seen this as a scarce resource, this information, the kind of more that's generated out of this, the, the better. Um, and the people who've done each bit of research obviously have ownership of it um, and they can write about that in any, any way that, that they want to. Um, so uh, we've, cried, we've tried to create a sense of sort of, I guess what's coming to mind is a kind of collaborative abundance, right? So, so mm. everybody, everybody can have ideas and everybody can take those ideas and, 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 and work with them. The only prescription that we've made is that people should be generous, which is something that doesn't happen very often in anthropology, that people should be very generous with citations. So people should try and cite each other's work that, that comes out of, the, out of the project and just remain supportive to each other's work going forward. So. Collaborative abundance is a really lovely phrase. <laughs> Communicating is partly about crafting words, isn't it? It's, we've, got, we've got a bunch of questions which are about having influence uh, or not. Um, so more about the relationship between you and the people you're trying to influence, whether some are about communities, but can we start with the, well, actually, no, the first one is general, actually, it's about stakeholders. But so I'll, I'll just read a, a couple of questions which are, which are linked. Um, this is from Helene, who asks, Laura mentioned the fact that stakeholders were not always convinced about anthropology's usefulness. Could you expand a bit more on that? What were the reasons? And then there's another one, which is from Becky. Thank you so much for the presentation. Why do you think anthropology and ethnography isn't adopted more widely as a core part of the policymaking processes and the policymakers skill set from your experience? So one is a, a bit broader about stakeholders and this and then there's one which is more narrow about policymakers. Why don't they listen to us? I mean, to be frank, um, there's obviously still a hierarchy between the quantitative and the qualitative. I'm sure all the people who are civil servants in the audience will 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 recognise that that somehow quantitative evidence is always seen as being more robust, more objective than than qualitative evidence. Um, and to answer the sort of first of first of those questions. Um, initially sort of resistance to anthropological ideas um, has really come from people who are engaged mainly in, in quantitative analysis. So what I've done in those circumstances is to take the people who are doing the quant back kind of back to the first principles that they're using in order to think about the categories that they're trying to understand. And once the quantitative people can see that I can engage with them at that kind of definitional foundational level, they start to get really, really interested. Um, you know, they understand that I can't do mediation analysis or different forms of statistical analysis, but they understand that uh, the anthropologist in the room can actually help them to remake some of the foundations or to explain things that they that they can't explain that are emerging from, from their data. So I think I think there are sort of so there's the problem of the quant qual. But there's also, um, well, again, a, a, a potentially big problem, which is the reliance on big data 
Um, it's very interesting to me that in the corporate sector, um, big data has always been used alongside qualitative data. But within government, there seems to be an assumption that big data trumps qualitative data or it has a greater prestige, um, uh, which I find very difficult to understand. Um, uh, I, I won't name names, but there's someone who always pushes back against that idea, who is a civil servant on, on Spy B, who always says, well, you can show the patterns with big data, but you can't explain the patterns, right? <laughs> you know, it all looks very convincing, it's a pattern, but how do you then explain it? And again, I'm sure the civil servants in the audience will recognize these sorts of tussles. Um, there are many, there are people who are, you know, anthropologists with PhDs um, amongst the, the civil servants who, who would share these frustrations, so. So, I mean, I think that yeah. means that we have to argue. I think we, in fact, I'm thinking about writing a, an article about interdisciplinary methods in the, in the pandemic with social psychologists and, and quant people for precisely this reason, because, you know, all of the interventions that we're making in relation to this research we're doing can take many different forms. They can be these reports, you know, that show that the evidence that anthropology provides is important and the concepts are important, but you can also make interventions which argue for the robustness of the methods of anthropology. And you, the best place to do that would be in kind of public health journals and things like that. And I'm planning to write a piece on that. Um, and we're also as a group pl planning to write a piece on um, sort of on the themes of this of this um, workshop itself that looks at you know what what it is that um, anthropology particularly can offer and these new models for collaboration um, in relation to live policy issues. I don't know if anybody else from the group would like to speak to that. Um, you know what what they think that anthropology how we might be able to argue robustly for anthropology. Um, I don't know, is Alice in the audience here? Because... I'm fairly sure she left the meeting. Oh, did she leave the meeting? Would you like to speak to that, Catherine, then? You haven't had a chance to. I haven't, but well, I just, I can't help noticing that we've got other interesting questions coming. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm yeah that you're um, more interested in answering maybe <laughs> well only there's one for example about um that seems to be asking a question about citizen science which mm. and I haven't been heavily involved with citizen science part of the project I don't think that Megan is here sadly but I wondered if anyone from the team wanted to share some thoughts about the potential for citizen science I'm, uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting because citizen science is a, um, a, a it, it can be, you know, there's obviously, uh, as Jordan said earlier on, there's the kind of critique of the critique within anthropology. So of course, there's already a critique of the idea of citizen science within, <laughs> within anthropology, very interesting critiques in the context of Japan in, in, in particular, and the use of citizen scientists in um, uh, making radiation levels acceptable around the, the Fukushima disaster. But that's not what we mean by citizen science. We're basically smuggling the old, the old anthropological idea of um, uh, sort of deep engagement with informants and you know, allowing informants to be become and be entirely equal to the anthropologist in the ways in which they um, generate evidence, generate arguments, generate data. So we're not, we're not thinking of citizen science as the popular version of science or the popular version of anthropology, we want to bring people on board as, as anthropologists and to give them the skills to do that. So I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to that. Nikita, do you want to speak to that? Or? Yeah, I suppose um, we're experimenting, I think. And I think that's what's so great about this kind of collective environment, um, uh, you know, and the fact that where we're kind of pulling bits of money together in order to continue to do that you know these are kind of germs of ideas that that we're kind of experimenting with so we hope in this next phase we can do some things like care mapping um, as Kieran was speaking about uh, it was very interesting to start to visualize what these maps of care that people have the different kind of financial and social and emotional dependencies that people have and to kind of illustrate how they um, how they uh, interact uh, with the 
regulations of the government. And we think this is kind of a really productive area that we can track over a longer period of time. So we had to do some more deep engagement with um, care mapping in certain communities. We think that this can be a means of understanding inequalities and how inequalities um, are generated by government policies as they cut these kind of care maps in different ways. Um, yeah, I suppose the other thing to mention um, that we haven't spoken about yet uh, is that it's, I think citizen science um, is not just about the collection of data, but also the presentation of data. So we've thought a lot about how we wanted to, how we want to present this report. And this is why we've really engaged with um, some visual uh, kind of media as well. So we commissioned an artist, Maggie Lee, who um, who we worked with to build this, what I think is a very beautiful illustration that's on the cover of our report and that tries to capture this idea of the kind, the kind of care map that I was talking about and the kind of interlinking of people and how some people are isolated and, and others are not um, in certain ways. Um, and also we have these incredible photos from um, a photographer called Gray Hutton, who had a grant from the National Geographic COVID-19 response to produce these beautiful photographs that you'll see in the report um, that basically capture the local res response in Hackney to COVID-19 and they are just stunning. Um, so I don't know, I could show some Emma if you wanted now, otherwise you can see them in the uh, report. Um, you know that it's very important um, as Gray uh, told us that, that they're accompanied with particular uh, captions that illustrate the kind of stories that we were picking up on and he was picking up on as a photographer. I can never resist an image if you've got them yeah. to hand. Yeah, let's see. Maybe you can take another question and I'll... This yeah. reminds me, Nikita, of um, Renato Rosaldo's point in Culture and Truth, you know, 1980, whenever it was published, that you use different mediums for different effects. So you might want, he, he pointed out that you'd write a development report to reach particular sorts of audiences, you'd write a novel to reach another, and you could do that with the same piece of research. And obviously, to use these mediums like photographs is incredibly powerful and important. Yeah. I can just I can flick through these while you take other questions Emma if you like okay good idea I've I found that I've got hold of the chat again um yes we have a couple of questions about working with communities um I'm going to read both so Zoe uh, Goodman asks beyond pushing for more funding and better wages could you say a bit more about how your research has supported the work of community organizations you've been working with or has been taken up by these organizations. And linked to this is a question from Preeti, um, who thanks you for the report and says, could you speak to the insight in the report that cooperation should be achieved by active policies of communication that push back against blame narratives, along with co-production of solutions with local authorities and communities? What does that look like practically? I'd really like to bring Jordan in on the first question. Hello, sorry I'm here. I've been having trouble with the internet. Um, again, I, I have to speak on behalf of my colleague who unfortunately gathered all the data um, that I explored along with them um, based in Hackney. Um, and I think he could better address the extent to which the report has had an impact um, and also what the, what we're calling for looks like uh, practically, because um, he sat in those meetings uh, between different community groups and Hackney Council and engaged in the discussions that they had. But I, I think something that he's brought up that I think is important and addresses a question from earlier about individual need versus group need um, is, and something that he's um, keen to, to say, you know, suggest should be replicated elsewhere is the way in which Hackney has different people with their, within the strategic um, policy team with their ear on the ground amongst particular groups. Um, so there is a discussion that focuses on the needs of particular groups rather than um, individuals. Um, and he's suggested that based on the data that you know, what he's witnessed as part of these discussions, 
um, but that is an essential part of it. Is it's very much um, the, the dialogue is very group based um, rather than individuals. Um, and in terms of the impact that the, the first question, the impact that the report has had um, on these communities, uh, I just spoke with Connor earlier today, and he said that numerous people that he's spoken with have reached out to him saying that the report itself has made its way through these various networks of um, community organizations, um, but apparently yet um, to be read. No one's actually read the report. <laughs> um, so unfortunately I can't, and I, Connor work, I don't think he would be able to quite comment, um, I'm speaking on his behalf, um, of the extent to which the report itself has kind of fed back into the, the communities um, that, he, that we're documenting. So sorry to not have too much insight there. No, that was that was really really interesting. Um, we've we've got one more question um, for the group um, from Cornelia Sarabji, who is a member of our RAI committee, um, and she says, as an anthropologist working in the civil service, thank you very much for this inspiring presentation. Uh, and she wrote this when you were making a point about quantitative and qualitative, which strikes a special chord. And her question is. Looking beyond SPI B and COVID-19, are there other government departments or Whitehall policy issues that you feel anthropologists could really help improve? Thank you, Cornelia. I, I'm gonna let everybody give one, <laughs> but I'll, I'll give mine. Um, I think uh, my dream would be to be advising the treasury on the economy. So nothing very ambitious there. <laughs> Um, I feel that, you know, as an economic anthropologist, you'll appreciate, Cornelia, that we have an entirely different perspective on what generates a flourishing economy. And I think more of that perspective within the Treasury would be great, but it's probably also the hardest arena of government to penetrate with anthropological ideas for exactly the reason that you talk about the quantitative versus qual. Having said that, I think that the natural allies would be um, more in the Department of Work and Pensions and also in, because they have to deal with the messiness of people's lives um, and also um, the Ministry of Housing, commu Housing, Community and Local Government, I've found a lot of really like-minded people there um, and trained anthropologists as well. Um, but I think the economy is the big one. <laughs> um, Kieran, do you want to, just Kieran, do you want to say where you think anthropologists could contribute? Oh, that's a really tough question, but I think I think if we could just have anthropologists sitting on every advisory group, just as Laura has been, because I think ethnographic research can provide such an insight in a way that other forms of, of qualitative and quantitative data just can't. I mean, I have to say I'm, I'm also very biased being a, an, a, you know, a background, a, a secret economist in anthropology that I would love to see anthropology really, really influencing economic policy, because I just think you know, after having taken Laura's economic anthropology module in one of my masters, um, seeing the impact of real life um, anthropological research on how economic policy influences people's lives in re like in reality would be, I, I hope we see that day. Catherine, do you want to? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I just think anthropologists tend to be uh, asking different questions um, and pointing people towards how the fundamentals of social life affect the way that uh, people interact with each other, how communities function, um, which shapes every single area of life. So as I think more of a question is, well, which area of policy making would anthropological insight not be relevant? Like, I think that's a harder question to answer than this one, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there for time. <laughs> Jordan? Jordan, we can't hear you. You haven't unmuted. Might be having problems with his internet again. Sorry, there. Is that oh, great. <laughs> Worth waiting. Sorry. Um, um, I, th I would like to shake up the home office, um, specifically on questions of, of immigration. Um, and asylum seeking. 
Good. Uh, we'll just ask Nikita as well, just so everybody gets a chance. Yeah, um, and Deborah after me. Um, yeah, I think um, for me, um, my PhD is also on mental health and care um, and, and gender. So I think Matthew has a question about care work and, and care work being absorbed um, by the household. And this is an area I'm really passionate about, the kind of burden of care that's been absorbed in the household and how that's resulted in various forms of, uh, new forms of inequality that are manifest as mental distress. I think looking at mental health as an issue of care um, is really important. And we have some strong recommendations about recovery uh, care centers and about a care wage, um, which would be really cool. Um, so I would love to promote that further um, with a conservative government, I'm not sure. But, um, but yeah, wages for housework, basically. Nikita, thank you so much. I was anticipating guilt that we had one question that wasn't going to be addressed. So thank you so much. Um, I think we do have to stop there. I just want to do two things, which is one is draw your attention to the fact that this series is monthly and the next one is on the 9th of December at um, 11 a.m., slightly different time. And that one will be about influencing parliament. And you'll hear from me and from Abby Hobbs, who is the head of social science um, within the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology in the Westminster Parliament. Um, but more importantly, I really want to give a huge thank you to the collective absolutely fantastic start to the series. I've really, really enjoyed it. I, I find Zoom a bit challenging normally, but I can say wholeheartedly that I enjoyed every moment of this, this particular session. And it was really, it was, as everyone has echoed again and again in the chat, it was very inspiring. And we need a bit of hope and inspiration in these tough times. So thank you so, so much. Um, can I hand back to Hanin? who I think is going to close the event. Yes, thank you, everybody. Um, there isn't really much more to say other than we hope you tune in again, and we hope you have a look at the REI events generally coming up in the future uh, on our website. And uh, I wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you for tuning in. Bye. <laughs>